Hey guys, welcome back to the Putting Your Financial Plan Together series. We are in part six of a 14 part series designed to do exactly what it says it's gonna do. It's going to help you put your financial plan together. You already have a financial plan, that's awesome. Use this as a wellness checkup to make sure that financial plan is still aligned with your current financial state and your short-term and long-term objectives. If you don't have a financial plan, today's the day. Hopefully you've watched the first five videos in the series already. If you have it, no worries. They're on my channel, go and check them out. If you find my videos helpful, make sure that you subscribe to my station, like my videos, I would greatly appreciate it. So what did we cover in the first five videos? Some of you already know this, but some of you don't. So in part one, we did an introduction to financial planning, talking about what it is, how it correlates, for instance, to your budget. And we finished up with life insurance, a term versus whole life conversation. We then moved into the next session where we talked about budgeting, basically telling your money where to go and what to do, making it more efficient, more disciplined, and therefore more productive, feeling like you got a raise. We talked about how to maximize savings and discounts and different budget line items to help the budget go even that much further. We then in the next section covered debt management and debt reduction, looking at individual areas of debt, credit card debt, medical bills, student loans, a mortgage. And the reason why we have to look at those separate is how we tackle each and every one of them and how we view each and every one of them is different. Therefore, we need a slightly unique game plan for each one as far as how to manage it and how to reduce it. We then moved on to emergency funds. How much to have? Where to have it? Should it be under my mattress, for instance? Should it be in a bank, etc.? Then this last session, we covered a lot of the cost around home ownership. So mortgages, for instance, we talked about 15 year versus 30 year mortgages. We talked about when to refinance and how to think through that. We talked about property taxes. We talked about homeowners insurance. And then we finished up with private mortgage insurance, or as a lot of you refer to it as PMI. We are now moving into the sixth session where we are going to be covering health insurance. And what we're going to do is we're just gonna ask a few questions together and then work through the things that we need to think about within that question. So first off, you need to ask yourself, am I in a group plan or am I shopping for my health insurance, for instance, if I'm self-employed? Because if you work for an employer and they provide you health insurance, you're limited to the options that are available on their health insurance plan. So you'll want to listen and learn about different things to think about when you're picking out a plan, but you're going to be limited in your options. If you're self-employed, for instance, then you have more options. You can, for instance, do an Affordable Care Act compliant plan, an ACA compliant plan, which is commonly referred to as Obamacare, purchased on the exchange. You also have the option to do short-term health insurance plans that are not ACA compliant, often carrying a much lower premium, but with that covering less things. So let's tackle that next. If you're shopping for yourself, you are asking yourself, there, there's probably more options than just these two, but for the most part, a lot of the options fall under these two categories either having some sort of short-term health insurance plan that would be not ACA compliant, not bought on the exchange, you're gonna buy it through a insurance group, or you're gonna to go to the exchange and you're gonna buy an Affordable Care Act compi compliant plan referred to by a lot of people as Obamacare. So a few things to think about. First off, short-term policies are going to often offer much lower premiums, particularly if you don't qualify for some of the tax credits available to low to mid-income people that are applying on the exchange for ACA compliant plans. And so even if you qualify for those tax credits, you'll still often find that the short-term plans are a better deal for you. 
But if you don't qualify for those tax credits, you'll definitely notice that the premium is a way better deal. And so at that point, you're thinking, well, this is a no-brainer. But you have to keep in mind that you have to look at how much am I paying and what am I getting for what I'm paying. So we're going to walk through that now. So a couple things to think about. Short-term health insurance is usually thought of as something that gets you to the next enrollment period. And so that's why it's referred to as short-term. Depending on the state that you live in, you can potentially have it longer than that. But the idea is to get you from one open enrollment period to the other. It's usually designed and thought of for healthy individuals and families. The reason why I say that is it doesn't cover a lot of pre-existing conditions. So someone that has a pre-existing condition is not going to find it attractive because they want their pre-existing condition covered, which it would be with a plan, for instance, purchased on the exchange. The availability and length of these varies by state. It's going to be pretty easy to find that online, but you're going to want to look that up because some states, short-term health insurance plans aren't available. Some it's up to three months, some it's up to six months, some it's up to 12 months, and then you have some states where it's 12 months and then you can also renew it three times in a row. So you can have it for three years. Confirm all this with your insurance agent when you're talking about your options, but based on my research, that's the current way that short-term health insurance is available. The enrollment process is usually quick, it's easy, it's fairly flexible. Once again, still sounds like the no-brainer between the two options, but it's very important to read the fine print on these because they don't cover as much. And since they don't cover as much, that's why they can charge you the lower premium. So they typically, but you're gonna to wanna to read the fine print, don't cover pre-existing conditions, they don't cover routine office visits, they don't cover maternity, they don't cover preventative care, they don't cover prescription drugs, and the list can go on from here. And so depending on your view of insurance, for some of us, and I tend to land in this bucket, I believe that insurance is designed to cover what I can't afford to pay. And so I can afford to pay for a wellness checkup with my nurse practitioner that I go to, but I don't wanna pay out of pocket for going into the ICU at the hospital. And so because of that, when I have insurance, I'm looking to have it more cover the big ticket items, having it cover preventative care, versus as well as a prescription drug here or there is going to be less important to me, but it might be really important to you. And prescription drugs vary a lot in cost. And so maybe that's a huge hit for you if your prescription drugs aren't covered. So some different things to think about with that short-term plan. If you're buying a plan on the exchange, the Affordable Care Act compliant plans, also referred to as Obamacare, you're going to find that these cover pre-existing conditions, that the coverage on these is much more exhaustive, and that's why they cost a lot more. And so I think it would be unwise to go into the situation believing that it's always the right decision to do an exchange plan or always the right decision to do a short-term health insurance plan. It's going to be situation by situation, case by case but there's some things for you to think about as you're making that decision. Some things you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to, no matter what type of health insurance plan you have. What's my deductible? How's my co-insurance ratio structured? What's my out-of-pocket max? And then after that, we'll cover things like co-pays, et cetera. So a deductible is, generally speaking, how much you have to pay before most things start kicking in. And your plan might cover certain things like preventative checkups, like a wellness exam from the beginning without you hitting your deductible. But for a lot of things, you've got to hit that deductible first. <clears throat> so for some of you, you might have, let's say a $5,000 deductible. And so for the most part, the first 5,000 you're going to be responsible for. Then after that, coinsurance is going to kick in. And let's say you're on an 80-20, meaning after that 5,000, you pay 20% of every expense. Your health insurance company pays the other 80%. 
that's going to bridge you from deductible to out-of-pocket max. If your out-of-pocket max, for instance, is 10,000, then you could pay up to $5,000 after your deductible in those 20% coinsurance chunks as different expenses come in. But then once you hit that 10,000, insurance covers everything. You also have to look at how does it handle copays? Am I responsible for doctor visits from day one? Or maybe it's one of those things that even though I have a deductible, when I go for a routine office visit to the doctor, I have a $35 copay instead of $140, for instance. Look at how prescription drug coverage works. Is it covered before the deductible? Is it only covered after the deductible? Look at in-network versus out-of-network. Do you have a set of doctors that you really like and you don't want to leave for another set of doctors? If so, your doctor being in network is very important because if they're out of network, it'll cost more. So you might pick one plan over the other because that's the one that your doctor is in. If you don't care and you're just gonna go out and you're gonna find a good doctor that's in network and you don't have to have a relationship with them, well then that one doesn't matter as much. And then just making sure you understand all of the different items that are covered prior to hitting the deductible. Common items there are preventative care type items. So those are the different things I want you to pay attention to, whether you're in a short-term insurance plan or a Affordable Care Act compliant plan, group health insurance, etc. Now the next thing you want to think about is healthcare savings accounts, HSAs. These are, I believe, never compatible with short-term health insurance plans. Check with your insurance agent on that. Sometimes there's random exceptions, but for the most part, they're not compatible with short-term plans. So if you get that short-term plan with that lower premium, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of HSAs and being able to contribute into them. You can use existing funds you have in an HSA, you just can't contribute new funds. So that's important to bring up there. You have uh, the access to an HSA in 2020. If your deductible is uh, $1,400 or more for a single individual, $2,800 or more for a family. And you can contribute up to $7,100 if you're a family and half of that if you're an individual. And you can use these funds to pay for deductibles, to pay for co-pays, to pay for co-insurance and some other healthcare expenses. It's very easy to find an entire list of these. If you Google HSA eligible medical expenses, for instance, hit enter, be cautious of the website you go to. You've heard this from me a lot and you should be able to find that pretty easy. Generally, you can't use it for premiums though. And so your health insurance premiums, you cannot use your HSA for, but the costs that you incur other than that, deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, and several other things are all gonna be covered by a healthcare savings account. It's a great tax advantage, and so definitely encourage you to take advantage of one of those if you have access to it. A few other things that uh, could be applicable to you. There's obviously Medicare out there, which is available to 65 and over individuals. You've probably heard that there's a Part A, a Part B, and a Part D. Each section just covers something different. Part A is health insurance, Part B is medical insurance, Part D is the prescription drug coverage. And so that's just how they break it out. If you look then at Medicaid, Medicaid is a joint federal and state program for people that fall into a few categories. Primarily it's low income is what qualifies you for Medicaid. There's also something that some of you might be familiar with. It's actually called MediShare, and it's a faith-based healthcare sharing ministry. And so if you go to their website, it'll just say a community of Christians who have agreed to live as the early church, referencing Acts 2 and 4, when it comes to sharing each other's burdens. If you are interested in that, I actually have a link down in the description of this video that will take you right to the informational page for more information on MediShare. I encourage you, if you're at all interested in that, please use that link 
doesn't cost you any extra to use that link, but it's actually beneficial for me from a referral standpoint if you go through that link. And so if you're considering MetaShare, or if you know someone that is, I would greatly appreciate if you would use my link or uh, forward it to your friends or family that you think would be interested in that. And then what I wanna do now is I wanna finish with dental and vision insurance. And so for these, a lot of times, I think it's as simple as do the math. And so if you know who you want to have uh, do your dental work, the dental office, then you can call and you can figure out what things cost out of pocket, look at what your insurance would cost for the year, and just make a decision. So for instance, if your entire if your entire cost for your family to go to the dentist for the year is fifteen hundred dollars, and to have health and dental to have dental insurance would be a hundred dollars a month. Well, then that's twelve hundred dollars in order to have fifteen hundred dollars of service. And unless there's some deductibles there, or they don't cover a hundred percent of it from day one, then it would be worth it. You're going to save three hundred dollars by getting the dental insurance. In another situation, you might find that it's maybe you're paying $200 more than what it costs for all of your preventative care, but you're willing to pay that $200 because it, it's insurance in case you end up with something bigger, such as a root canal. So you just kind of got to do the math and make an educated guess there. Vision insurance, same thing. You call the doctor that you get your eye exam through, and usually you'll probably be talking to his receptionist or office manager, for instance, and you are pricing out how much is an annual exam, do I get glasses or contacts, etc. what does the vision insurance cost for the year, and then you do the math. So a lot of times I think dental and vision insurance, it can be that simple. If you have glasses and contacts, vision insurance is gonna probably be favorable for you. If not, it, I just priced it out. I don't have glasses or contacts and it's about break even for me. So I probably won't do it, make the effort if it's break even. For dental, are you prone to things bigger than just preventative checkups? If not, it's probably not gonna be that favorable, but do the math. But if, if you've had a history of issues such as root canals, then maybe it's good to have that insurance on it. So hopefully you've been finding this uh, session helpful and stay tuned for this next session when we talk about everything you need to think about when it comes to your automobiles. Thank you.